Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode of What's on Tap. I'm Eric Webler. And I'm Cam LaValle. We're here in downtown Binghamton. Our journey begins today when we find out what's on tap here at Water Street Brewing Company. Across the nation, people have turned the hobby of crafting beer into a lifestyle. Amazing breweries are only a few minutes away from your own home. From nano to regional, or micro to macro, the question you won't need to ask is what's on tap. We're here inside Water Street Brewing Company. They first opened their doors back in 2011. They got some awesome beer, some amazing food, but enough of us talking about this. Let's hear from the owners themselves. After opening up under different ownership, longtime employee Kristen Andrasik took over the reins last year. In March of 2012, I came on as a bartender in May of that year. And then last May, seven years later, seven, yeah. uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to take over and it's where we are now. When it comes to head brewer Nick Hall, his roots are very similar to Kristen's. I originally worked as a bartender here as well. I started, I think, 2014, then went elsewhere for a couple of years, came back, and then uh, trained as assistant brewer at that time. And then the previous head brewer moved on, so uh, I was fortunate enough to take over uh, a little over a year ago as, as the head brewer. When you're in the brewery business, picking a favorite beer could be like picking your favorite child. But we all know you have one. To me, honestly, it depends on you know what's on tap. We have 14 tap lines available. Um, I kind of change with the seasons, though. Um, right now, I'm drinking the Melmac IPA. It's more of like a classic style IPA. Um, I do tend to go to the dark beers, though. I had the Imperial Stout last night. I know it's not really seasonal, but I like it. We usually have a few that are always on. Uh, COVID kind of changed that a bit because we had to adjust. But we usually always have a few, but then we also have several taps that we play around with, try new stuff, or we have stuff that's out like once a year seasonally. Um, I tend to lean towards lagers in general, right? I mean, especially with the heat lately, I've been re really leaning towards the Mexican lager myself, but, but I also try, I mean, I've been drinking a lot of the brown too. Uh, so just various things, whatever, whatever suits my fancy that day, you know? With their future goals in mind, these favorite beers may be coming to a bar or store near you. Before the COVID thing, we were focusing on in increasing our distribution footprint. This has sort of put a damper on that, especially since you know, you're not gonna uh, distribute to a bar when the bar is closed, of course. So I think in the, in the not too, too distant future, I think we're gonna try and ramp that up again. Try and sell more of our kegs to bars now that bars are opening back up. Uh, do some more packaging and sell packaging to uh, bottle shops and, and, and such. But these beers need to be made somehow. Let's head with Nick to the back to see what goes on when making these beers. All right, Nick, so what we got going on here? Uh, so today we're brewing uh, an American Pale Ale. Right now I'm mashing in. Uh, so American Pale Ales are nice, uh, highly attenuated beer. So that means that uh, there's not a lot of residual sugar to it, so not a lot of sweetness. Uh, nice hoppiness, but uh, very drinkable. So a lot of classic American hop flavors. You get your citrus, you, uh, you get a little bit of pine. Uh, this uses predominantly Cascade hops, which are a classic Northwest American hop. Uh, so yeah, but right now we're moving grain from the hopper uh, into here with a lot of hot water. Uh, and that's gonna uh, extract a lot of the sugars that we need in order to make alcohol, which is yeah. of course an important part of beer as well. Yeah, I mean, it seems like obviously it's not a very big building you have here, not a lot of workspace. Is pretty much everything you need to brew right here in this room? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is the brew house, which has three main vessels to it. Uh, the bottom here is a hot liquor tank, and what that does is just heat up water. Uh, this is the boil kettle, uh, where later we'll move the uh, sugary liquid into there and boil it along with the hops. Uh, and this is the mash tun where we mix the hot water and uh, the, uh, uh, the grain, yeah, to, to produce wort, exactly. Uh, behind, uh, over there actually, there are some fermenters where uh, we turn that sweet wort into alcohol. Uh, and then we have serving tanks. This is the heart of the brewery, for sure. And yeah, it's a, it's a smallish brewery. We have a seven barrel system. Each barrel is 31 gallons. Um, but I like that size because there's still a lot of manual labor to it, so it's, it's really still a craft. Not the bigger breweries aren't crafts as well, but 
That's sort of like getting your, you know, your sweat into it and some muscle into it as well. Feels like you earned that beer at the end of the day, you know? Even with Nick Brewing in the back, beer isn't the only thing made here. We head over to the kitchen to taste test some of Chef CJ Walken's special wings with a name even Joe Exotic would love. All right, CJ, so these are the Tiger King wings, right? Yeah. Tell me what's going on. Um, they're inspired by, you know, the Tiger King. Everybody likes the Tiger King, so we, you know, add a little something that, you know, they can relate to. Okay, Tiger King, so the wings have to be wild. They have uh, peanut butter in them. They're um, sesame seed oil. I infused a little bit of um, butter and honey into the mix to also bring out the flavor. And I also used uh, some umami, which is a uh, Japanese uh, seasoning. It's like a real rich, almost like a real rich beefy flavor. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and you know, and it mixes good when you're making a nice sauce like that. Tell me what you think, man. Wow. You know, a lot of times for what I mean, when I'm eating food, I don't even think about putting peanut butter into it, and it's got that, the thickness of the peanut butter. I feel it on my lips already. Like. You get a little taste of it too, but I'm not a spicy guy. There is just enough kick that it's still delicious, and it's, it doesn't feel like my mouth's on fire. Yeah, I got some food right here. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm gonna be taking these and finishing them now. All their food incorporates with their beer, and it, it makes it all more tasty. So we've seen the food. We know how the beer is made, and now it's time to pour, pour four. four. So we said pour four, but we got five here in front of us. You know, that's awesome. I mean, more beer for us, right? Exactly. So tell us what we got here. Let's go one by one. What do you think? Lightest, darkest? What do you want to go first? Yeah, let's start at the top of the list here. It'll be the one on your handle here. This is our Mexican lager. Uh, so this is a recent addition to our lineup. We do a lot of lagers here. Uh, the Mexican lager is a great drink over the summer, so it's gonna be uh, in the mid 5% range for, for ABV, uh, but really light, crisp. Uh, Mexican lagers are actually an offshoot of Vienna lagers back in the day. It uses a lot of Vienna malt, uh, adds corn to it, uh, very highly attenuated, so super easy to drink on a hot summer day. Yep. And this one actually what I did um, is late in the boil, I added some Motueca hops. So there's a little bit of spin off the traditional Mexican lager, so you might catch a hint of lime in that. That's actually from the hops at the end of the boil. It's a New Zealand hop, but it adds a little bit of natural lime into it, but you could also add your own lime if that's what you like. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's very easy to drink. I mean, this is what I feel like for somebody who isn't, come, who's coming to a brewery and is new to the craft beer scene, I mean, this was a, their, your transition into it. So next we've got our Vienna Lager. This is called the Parapraxis Vienna Lager. Yep, that one right there. Uh, so this is an amber lager. Uh, so this one you're gonna get a lot of maltiness to it, uh, slight bitterness, but still not a lot. Not overpowering because of the malt balance to it. Uh, so you might get notes of like, uh, maybe a little bit of chocolate, some, uh, uh, yeah, so some caramel, like that sort of like rich flavor to it. Um, so yeah, that's also, also a recent addition, but another lager in our lineup. I can, I can kind of see something like you said with the last one, if, if you're new to craft beer, this is great if you want a little more flavor, looking for something a little more distinct than just your average Pilsner or ale. It's incredible. So next we got the red ale. The Irish red, yeah. So uh, this is a nice low ABV beer, 4%. Uh, so also another easy drinker, pretty smooth, a slight roastiness to it because it has some uh, roasted barley into it. And this one, I decided to brew a red. I've always liked reds. Actually, one of my, the first beers that I liked that wasn't that sort of macro lager uh, was Smithix. So this is in that same vein. Um, a little drier for this than the Smithix. Smithix is a little sweeter, but still something that, as you said, uh, we're sort of transitioning into things that people might, um, as they get further into craft beer, try different styles, but definitely an easy drinker too. I don't know what it is. I, I've come to really start loving red ales. Good, excellent. Yeah. You guys, is no, awesome. Yeah, this is a big moment. This is the first red ale I've ever had. I've never had a red ale before, and now I could definitely see myself going into a place and seeking them out. It is delicious. Great. All right, so next on the lineup, we've got our Melmac IPA. 
So we do brew several different types of IPAs. Uh, we brew the hazies that are really popular right now. Our Road to El Dorado is one that's really popular. Unfortunately, we don't have it on tap at the moment, but it's coming back soon. But this is another one that we have. So this is much more closer to sort of a West Coast IPA. So it's gonna be clear, crisp, nice bitterness to it, but lots of citrus punch to it. So this is something that, you know, as, uh, uh, a new craft beer drinker might not love this because it's got that distinct bitterness to it. But as you said, your palate expands as you continue uh, getting into the craft beer world. Oh, yeah. So this is sort of a, a throwback to before Hazy sort of dominated IPAs. This is uh, something that people might have had a few years ago. IPAs, it's such, that's, that's the big jump, I feel like, for uh, regular beer drinkers to craft beer. Because uh, all of a sudden you keep having more and more and more. And at first you're like, oh, it's got that bitterness. But I drink it now and I'm like, this is... It just, it, it's an incredible beer. Kind of the same story. Everybody, I feel like drinking beer, you saw it real life. I started transitioning into IPAs. I, there's something about them that caught me right away. Yeah. And I found myself going after doubles, imperials, trip, like really trying to get that whole spectrum of the IPAs. And I mean, this one is a great, great solid IPA. I hate that we have to say the last one. Yeah. yeah, the last one, unfortunately. So this is one of the actual first beers that we had at Water Street Brewing uh, when we first opened. So it's called the Thousand Year Porter. So English style porter, uh, not what you normally drink on a hot day, but it's good any time of year in my opinion. So it uh, uses a lot of um, specialty malts that give it sort of a chocolate and coffee flavor to it. Uh, nice fullness, uh, also nice bitterness. It's a, it's a robust porter, so it's got a, a bittering balance to it as well. Uh, but definitely something that I always enjoy. And I feel like you almost need the bitterness with this to kind of counteract the coffee. It complements so well. Like I could see this being middle of winter, drinking it by a fire. Just Absolutely. I was just about to say campfire yeah. because yeah. when you think about the campfire at night, it starts getting colder into the night. That's when you start. I feel like this is just one of those beers that's like you're sitting around a fire and it's just you relax. to enjoy it, relax, have yeah. a good time. This is awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I think it's a great taste of what Water Street has to offer. Yeah, I think this is a bit of a variety we have, and we have 14 on tap at any time, and we pride ourselves in doing a wide variety. Like I said, the, the hazy sort of dominate right now, and we do have those, but we also want to show people what else there is in craft beer. So, Absolutely. yeah. Well, Nick, thank you so much. This, this is you. awesome. I appreciate it. What do you guys think of Water Street? Love it. Awesome. Oh, love it. Oh, gosh, love it. You could not wait for them to reopen. To and, yeah. and we're not from around here, but we'd love to stop in and we're in there. Yep. Bars looking to get kegs from Water Street don't have to jump through any hoops. It's actually really simple. They can call the number here. Yeah, so we, they can call our phone number uh, our, on our website or email us at uh, wsbrewingco Co. at gmail.com. <laughs> All those things, yeah. Well, that wraps it up for us here at Water Street Brewing Company. Thank you to them for everything, the beer, the food, and the great time. We can't wait to share this with you, so be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter and Instagram so you can see where our journey takes us next on What's on Tap. Cheers. That was that it. Was it.